good morning, Manitou Springs. How are you? It is so good to see your faces. My name is Andrew. If you don't know who I am, I'm one of the teaching pastors on staff with New Life Church. And um, Joe invited me to come during Advent here and preach to you. So I'm excited to do that. I just, I love, you know, we are, uh, one of the things that we say at New Life is that we're one church in six different congregations. So we have New Life North and Friday night. We have a Chinese congregation. Did you know that? It's been meeting for about 15 years at New Life North. Amazing. Uh, Nueva Vida. Uh, we have New Life Downtown. And then this, Manitou Springs. And I, um, I just love Manitou Springs. I love the idea of a Manitou Springs congregation. And I live over on the east side of town. We're kind of up on this sort of uh, bank on the east side. So I go for these runs sometimes. And on one of my runs, I can see all of Manitou Springs kind of laid out over there. And I just always think about the beauty of, well, you guys and what you're doing together. And I think there is this, um, this warm glow of the Spirit's fire and His love and God's goodness in the middle of Manitou Springs. And I feel like, and I don't know if uh, the numbers bear this out. Actually, I think they probably do. I feel like every time I come back here, I see that life taking hold more and more, that there are more people here and there's more energy here. So God is clearly doing something. And just from New Life Church really to you, I just kind of want to say good job. Like, thanks for leaning into this and making this congregation go. Thanks for being part of how the body of Christ is taking shape in a fresh way, Manitou Springs. Just so inspiring. So I have a message for you this morning. This is, um, we're in the season known as Advent. If you don't know anything about Advent, all you need to know is that Advent really kicks off the Christian calendar. And the Christian calendar is the church's attempt every year to lean back into the story of how God has come among us in Jesus. And so Advent is a, a Latin word. Uh, it comes from a Latin word, Adventus. Can you say Adventus? Yes. That translates the Greek word parousia. You want to say parousia? You have said Latin and Greek already. Right. It's amazing, right? Good job. Parousia means coming. It's coming. And one of the things that we believe in Christianity is that this world is not, um, God is not up in the clouds somewhere, but in him we live and move and have our being, right? God is already, always, all around us, all the time. But there's this moment that we look forward to at the end of history when God's presence, the presence of the living Lord Jesus, will be made manifest in a way that leaves no doubt. Right now, his presence is hidden, isn't it? We see glimmers of his presence when we gather for worship, when we open the scriptures, when we take the sacrament. We see and we sense his presence, but there is a time coming where he will split the eastern sky, and the scripture says that every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the nations on the earth, the scripture says, will mourn because of him. There will be this unmaking that will, that will happen. So what we do in Advent is we turn our attention once again to that moment where Christ Jesus will return again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And that's a real unique thing about Christianity, is that we don't just believe that history is sort of going al along in this kind of endless cycle of becoming, but there's this decisive moment coming where the Lord will cause every eye to see him. So I want to take you into a classic Advent text this morning that really puts the issue of what does it mean to be an Advent people who are prepared for the Lord, um, where it puts that issue front and center for us. Sound good? Before we get to that, that's going to be Luke chapter 3, by the way. If you have Bibles, I'll invite you to start thumbing through uh, your Bible, New Testament, to Luke chapter 3, and I'm going to be in verses 7 through 18. And, uh, but before we get to that, let's just pause for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we do confess to you this morning to be the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Like every breath is a gift of God. The blood coursing through our veins is a gift of God. Our awareness is a gift of God. Our hunger for you is a gift of God. We always live by the gift of God, and we want to remember that. The worst moments of our lives surely are the moments where we think that we live by ourselves or on our own or for ourselves. We just pray um, that you would put us back in your love, put us back in your goodness, put us back in your life this morning. We're asking, Lord, that as we open the scriptures, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, you gathered 
with a group of hungry people and you took bread that didn't seem like it was going to be enough and you lifted it up to heaven and you gave thanks and you broke it and that bread was distributed to feed the multitudes, we're asking that you do the same thing with the scriptures this morning. That you would lift up these scriptures which, which sometimes just seem so ancient and removed and maybe not enough for us. And I'm praying, Lord Jesus, that you would preach this morning that you would take the scriptures and that you would bless them, that you would break them, that you would distribute them to us. And these words on the page would become much more than words on a page, that they would become an access point into your life, a place for us to step into the kingdom. So that's about the best thing I can ask for this morning. And I'm praying that you do that. I'm praying that you would help the preacher get out of the way here. I'm praying that you would help us get our flesh out of the way. And uh, we're asking that you would come with the fire of your kingdom. Help us see you afresh. So grant that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves that we have Abraham as our father. For I'm telling you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Well, what should we do then? The crowd asked. When John answered, anyone who has two shirts, let him share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Well, don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? And he replied, don't extort people or money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered them all straightforwardly here, I'm baptizing you with water. But the one who is coming is more powerful than I. And the straps of his sandals I am not worthy to untie and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with what? Fire. Fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable, what's the word? Fire. Fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. This is the word of the Lord, brothers and sisters, and everybody said, thanks be to God, or amen will do. John is a chipper fella, don't you think? an encouraging Christmas message this morning. You brood of vipers, right? Who warned you, he says, to flee from the wrath to come. You're like, John, can we just take a time out here for a second? Is this anger? Is this vitriol? Is this bitterness? Is your rage really justified? John, people are responding to your ministry. You know, like you're a weird guy, okay? leather skins and camel hair and the leather belt around your waist and your food is locusts and wild honey. You're like this deranged, crazy person out in the desert preaching repentance. You should be thankful that anybody is responding to your message at all. Why are you so crabby? But see, John sees something that's not easy to see on the surface of reality. What John sees is the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, John sees the coming of the kingdom of God in two dimensions. So what he sees is the coming of the Messiah and the arrival of God's kingdom in full as the exact same event. We, with the hindsight of history, know that Jesus came and his kingdom is yet to be fulfilled. It's yet to be consummated, right? So it's a different kind of perspective that we have. But John was not wrong in what he saw. Just because his vision was two dimensions and ours is more or less three dimensions, John was not wrong in what he saw. And what John saw was that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah, is not the coming of a kingdom that baptizes our kingdoms. It's not a coming of a kingdom that just sort of sprinkles uh, magical favor dust over our lives and everything is wonderful now. John sees that the coming of the kingdom of God is a displacing reality. That when God's kingdom arrives, what happens is it displaces injustice and it displaces poverty and it displaces greed and it displaces exploitation. The coming of the kingdom of God 
burns out of human life all of the things that stand against the Creator's good intentions for human life. Are we on the same page this morning? Say amen. That's what the kingdom of God does. And so that's why he says, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. And every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be burned and thrown into the fire. The fire is coming. It's going to burn out of God's good world every evil thing. And so the crowds are noticeably shaken by this, right? Oh, okay. So this isn't just a religious ritual that we're doing here with you, is it, John? It's something bigger than that. What should we do? How, John, should we prepare for the arrival of the kingdom of God. And John's advice to them, I think, is so telling. It's a window into what God wants out of his people. He says, you want to know how you can prepare for the coming kingdom of God? Do you have two shirts? Give one to somebody that has no shirts. Do you have food? Give it to somebody that has no food. Do you have a job? where it would be really easy to take advantage of other people, where it would be easy to overbill or charge for a service or recommend a service that these people don't need, if that's your position, do not do that. Render justice to them. Give fairness to the people that you serve. Do you have the kind of position in society where it would be really easy to take advantage of the powerlessness of other people in order to increase your status and your power? He's saying this to the soldiers. Don't you exploit people. Don't take advantage of them to climb up the ranks and to prove that you're a really worthy soldier. You just be content with your pay. Do you see what John is doing? These people are asking how they should prepare for the arrival of the kingdom of God, and he directs their attention to neighbors, to people. How you treat people says everything about the kind of kingdom that you belong to. Can I get an amen out of you this morning? So John's preaching... I think puts this issue front and center for us, that when we talk about biblical righteousness, biblical righteousness is always a thing that puts the issue of our neighbors, the people of our lives front and center. It never divides the two. Biblical righteousness never just kind of locks us into this sort of horizontal relationship with God. It never just calls us into a place of pure sort of piety where we just have fuzzy feelings with God. But biblical righteousness always throws us into the grit of life where everything has happened with people that are hungry and thirsty and don't have enough and are on the verge of being exploited. And it calls us to render justice and mercy and faithfulness and truth to them. Are you with me this morning? It's easy to forget this as religious people. I know because I've done it. I remember falling in with a group of people years ago that were really hungry for God. That's how they would have described themselves and um, contending for revival to come to our church and to our city, to our region. And so when we got together, when I got together with that group of people, it was always prayer meetings all the time. It was a praying, it was just a fervent for the Lord, right? In times of worship, we have these long times of worship, and we were always talking with one another about, how's your, how's your walk with God going? And by that, we meant, how's your devotional life going? So we measured our spirituality by the level of our intensity at spiritual disciplines. And whenever we got together, all the conversations were very spiritual conversations. What's the Lord teaching you this week? Where's he revealing himself to you in the scriptures this week? And we get together, and we would just have these lofty conversations about all of these new truths that were breaking out for us on the pages of the scriptures. And one of the things that I remember about that season is that we only really cared about people insofar as people made sense within this thing that we were doing, trying to call people into this intense space of revival or whatever. And for the most part, we were pretty contemptuous of people that didn't run with us. And we had no real robust concern for neighbors, for people around us. And we thought that we were doing pretty well. And it's been 15, 20 years maybe since that time. And I know that I didn't realize it at the time, but I know it now because I know God better than I knew God then. Um, that that way of living our faith, um, that was odious to God. That's a stench in God's nostrils. When we practice our piety in that way, that vertical dimension of our relationship with God, and we're real intense about that, but we have no real concern for other people, that's a stench in the nostrils of God. He hates that. And I'll give you just a 
quick sampling of some scriptures that point this out. But you know, in the prophets of Israel, when they thundered against the people of God, more often than not, when they thundered against God's people, it's because God's people had forgotten that. There was a lot of intensity in their relationship with God, quote unquote, but not a lot of intensity in the level of their horizontal righteousness. Here's Isaiah. Look at Isaiah. The Lord speaking through the lips of Isaiah said, stop bringing meaningless offerings to me. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Worthless assemblies is what God calls them. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. Verse 17. So this is what you're going to do. Learn. Don't just learn to be religious people. He says, learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Like those people that are around you that are suffering, do you want to show your righteousness? Go perform your righteousness for them. Lift up the fallen. Lift up the weak. Feed the hungry. Give a cup of cold water in the name of Yahweh. Don't just take the name of Yahweh on your lips in some religious way, but do it in a way that demonstrates the character of Yahweh for people. Look at Amos. Here's how Amos puts it. The Lord says through Amos, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Verse 23, away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let, this is one of the great statements of God's justice in all the Old Testament, but let justice roll on like a river righteousness like a never-failing stream. That's the prophet Amos. Look at Micah. Here's how Micah puts it. Micah says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Like what great sacrifice can I make to you, O Lord? And then we get this in verse eight. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Like you want to show that you're a person that's connected to the righteousness of God? Then do this. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Put God's character on display. James in the New Testament writes this. He says that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Guys, these people come to John the Baptist 2,000 years ago. And you know what they want to do? They hear that there's this wrath coming. They hear that there's a kingdom coming that's going to displace all worldly kingdoms. You know what they try to do? They try to just engage in the religious ritual so that they can save their butts. Hey, John, splash some water on us. And that's why he was frustrated. He goes, you don't get it. You think this is about performing the religious ritual? The religious ritual is empty without repentance. And they go, oh, okay, so it's not about the religious ritual. It's really about being the children of Abraham, right? Let me show you my credentials, John. Here I am. I can show you the DNA test. I belong to the family of Israel. I'm one of God's people. And John goes, it's not the religious ritual, and it's not your religious ancestry that counts. It's whether or not you demonstrate the fruit of the kingdom of God that is coming. So here's the question that John puts to us. Question. Put the next slide up on the screen. Who are God's people? And John's answer to that question is this. That God's people are those whom God is touching with the demand of the neighbor. God's people are those whom God is touching with the demand of the neighbor. It's not the people that have done the right religious ritual, and it's not the people that have the right religious pedigree. It's the people who have the character of God growing in them. It's the people who have the heart of God growing in them. And this stuff gets really messy, guys. Opening ourselves up to the ways in which God wants to thrust us out towards our neighbors in compassion, it's messy. It demands death in us. There's a crucifixion that has to take place in us because we are born into selfishness. We like our little world and we like to only think about ourselves and the people that we care about. We don't like to think about neighbors. We don't like to think about people that are intrusive. And my wife and I Uh, Mandy is up at North today with our two oldest boys who wanted to do the junior high thing up there, so she's not here with us today. But Mandy and I have been married for 18 and a half years, and when we were newlyweds, uh, we were very uh, devout and good Christian kids. And uh, we went to a Christian college in the Midwest, 
And uh, we got married real young. You know, I was 19, she was 20. So our first apartment was this little six or 700 or so square foot apartment real close to the university. And we had like an ideal situation. On one side of us, we were on the second floor. So on one side of us were two of our best friends, another married couple that had moved, also moved down from Wisconsin, that's from, from where we're from, to go to the Christian college. So we had like our best friends over here, right? Great neighbors, right? Then on the other side of us, we had this other newlywed couple who was also going to the Christian university, just on this side. So we got Christianity everywhere, all of our good Christian neighbors, right? And then just down below us, to the left, there was this old guy, I think his name was Don, and we never really saw or heard much from him. We just knew that he liked to trout fish and he was gone like most of the time. So there's another ideal neighbor. We got Christians, Christians, and a guy that's never there. And then right underneath us was like a, a demo apartment uh, that was staged. And when the apartment complex people were showing the apartment, they would always take them to that. It was, an, it was empty. No humans live there. The best neighbors. <laughs> Nobody at all. Mandy and I just got on for that first year or so. We just loved our little situation. And all of a sudden, I remember we came home one, one day and we saw that there was a moving truck and they were taking all of the staged furniture out of the apartment right underneath us and they were putting in somebody else's furniture. And it was like a lot of stuff too. They're jamming in this little apartment, you know, we're going, oh, crumb. You know, our beautiful little world is about to be interrupted. And you just think to yourself, Lord, this is okay. And we, we were kids at the time. So please forgive me. It's been a long time. There's a lot of sanctification has happened since then. But you, the prayer that you sort of pray is, Lord, um, help them not be stinky or loud. That's all, that's all we're asking for. Not stinky, not loud. Just, I don't, we don't want neighbors that disturb our world, you know. And it wasn't more than a night or two. I think it was probably actually the first night that this person moved in. Uh, Mandy and I were sleeping at one or two in the morning. And all of a sudden, we jolted awake by a cigarette smoke that was as intense as anything I have experienced. Now, if you smoke, I'm not throwing condemnation on you. Lord love you. But it was like a lot. It was like a blue cloud of cigarette smoke, like coming through the, the vents, you know? And you go, oh, dear me, I hope that this is not like a thing. And it was like three or four hours worth. Oh, this smoke, and you're like throwing open the windows and turning on the fans and trying to ventilate your apartment, and you can't. You wake up the next morning and you haven't slept all night. You go, maybe it's just a one time thing. Well, it wasn't a one time thing. The next night, it was the same thing. And then the next night, the same thing. And then the same thing, the same thing. It's like every single night, our world disturbed by this woman. And I'm not going to lie to you, we um, sought every legal recourse to try to handle our new neighbor downstairs. You know, I remember reading through our lease and trying to figure out, there's got to be some violation in here. She can't do this to us, you know? And I went to, we went to the apartment managers and we go, what is, there's got to be something that we can do here, right? No, there's like nothing that we could do. If we had broken our lease, we would have had to pay six to eight months of rent or whatever it was. We're totally stuck. And eventually we learned that it was like this old lady. So we have this image now, and you've been in these situations, right, where somebody disturbs your world, and all of a sudden the image that you have of them, there is like a lot of contempt that kind of grows up around your idea of them. And so we have this woman living below us that there is like this growing contempt that we have for her. And Mandy and I, I never forget this, and I don't remember what month of the year it was, but I can tell you what day of the month it was, because at the time we were doing couples devotions, and we would read the proverb of the day every morning. And so we were in Proverbs chapter 14, it was the 14th day of the month. And we were sitting on our couch, and we read this. I'll never forget this. He who despises his neighbor sins. Period. He who despises his neighbor sins. We're getting on. We're this wonderful little Christian couple trying to have a good little Christian world. And we've got this woman below us that somehow we were nursing this contempt for. And we just didn't realize how out of sync that was with biblical righteousness. He who is kind to his, or he despises his neighbor sins, and then the proverb goes on, but blessed is the person who is kind to the needy. And it was like, you ever have those moments where just conviction hits you? Oh, everything I'm doing is wrong. It's, try, it's time to change my life. So you know, what do we do? We decided to make this woman a plate of cookies and go down and introduce ourselves to her. So Mandy made some cookies, that day, after work, we went, we knocked on her door, she opened the door, probably 85 or so years old, an old woman, 
and we gave her the cookies and we introduced ourselves. Hi, I'm Andrew. This is Mandy. What's your name? She introduced herself to us. Her name is Linda. We said, Linda, hi, we're so, you know, you're saying this, right? <laughs> we're delighted <laughs> to have you in our apartment complex. Um, and we started to listen to her story. And the story with Linda was that she had been married to a wealthy man and was married to him for 50 years or so, 60 years, something like that. And then he died suddenly. They had a large and sprawling estate. He died suddenly. And she did not know this, but she actually left, or he left her with quite a bit of debt. And so she had to sell off most of what they had to pay off the debt. And her life, which had been this large sprawling thing, was reduced to about a 600 square foot or so apartment. And she's jammed in there. And she would spend most of the night awake, smoking, and thinking about her life that she once had and the loneliness that she was dealing with. Oh, people, guys, people. And it changed everything. It changed the whole way that we thought about her, the whole way that we felt towards her, the whole way we behaved towards her. Why? Because that's what God's righteousness does. People get inside of us, and it messes up the way that we think and feel about people. It messes up the whole structure of our affection for other people, and that's what God does. When God's agape starts to grip us, that's what happens to us. And by the way, the New Testament has a name for the agape of God. It's Jesus. That's what happens when Jesus comes riding into our lives, is that he takes our little status quo world that feels really good to us and feels really wonderful to us, and he blows it to smithereens because he puts the demand of the neighbor front and center for us. And a lot of times, I think, that when we think about this stuff, we go, okay, well, then what are you saying to me, Andrew? What's the thing that I'm supposed to do? Are you telling me, like John the Baptist, that I'm supposed to give away my shirts and my food? Or are, you, are you telling me that I, what, what are you telling me to do? But that's exactly the problem with us, isn't it? That we're always trying to define the limit of our love. We're trying to figure out what is the bare minimum that I need to do to be acceptable to God or what is sort of the wall of my love that when I've hit that, then I know I've filled it up. And Jesus actually, he handles this in the New Testament. A couple chapters later, the book of Luke, Luke chapter 10. I'm sure you know the story. On one occasion, the scripture says, verse 25 of Luke 10, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what will it look like? What do I need to do to step into the age to come? What do, what do I need to do to be a participant in the kingdom of God? What is written in the, in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And he answered, this is a good Orthodox answer because he's a good Orthodox guy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, right? A very thorough guy. And just to prove the point that he knows the law inside and out, he goes, love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. You will enter into the life of the kingdom of God. Now, this guy feels like he's on a roll, right? So he goes, um, who is my neighbor? Scripture says that he wanted to justify himself. And in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. And they stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, another religious guy, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, Samaritans were hated by Jewish people, by the way. Half-breeds, not pure Israelites, worshipped in a funny way, very unorthodox, you know. And Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of the story here. He says, a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged him, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. Then the next day he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense. Everybody say any extra expense. Amen. Any extra expense. This is like limitless love. It's not like just do a couple nice things for this guy, but it's like take responsibility for him. Which of these three, Jesus says, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Do you see what Jesus has done? So John the Baptist, in counseling people about what it looks like to enter into the kingdom of God, he counsels us to put neighbors front and center. If you have two shirts and your neighbor doesn't have one, give a shirt away. If you have some food and your neighbor doesn't have any, give some away. Treat your neighbors right. So John counsels us 
in how to be good neighbors or how to render right service to neighbors. But what does Jesus do in the parable of the Good Samaritan? He turns the whole thing on its head and he shows us how to be good neighbors. And what does it mean to be a good neighbor? It means that you live in the limitless love of God for other people. And you go, well, I can't do that. I go, well, I can't either. And it's the beauty of coming and being part of the church is that we're honest about the fact that our love is a broken love. It's a failing love. It's a love that needs to be saved. It's a love that needs to be redeemed. And this is what makes Christianity very different than any other religion or system of thought out there in the world today. I remember getting in a, in a conversation with a friend of mine on Facebook five or six years ago. This was a guy who was born and raised in Christianity, had abandoned his faith, rejected his faith, and was kind of on this crusade to show that Christianity wasn't really all that special after all. And I remember on Facebook one day, he posted a, a little meme, a quote by the ancient Chinese philosopher Confucius. And Confucius said, uh, do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. That have a familiar ring to it? Yeah, a little bit, right? And he posted on Facebook and he goes, <laughs> he goes, see, all the great systems of thought in our world are all teaching the same morality. I said, is that it? No, no. Hold on. Well, Confucius, and I remember stopping, uh, I got in this conversation with him. I go, bro, listen, Confucius's morality is a negative morality, okay? The morality of Confucius is, if you leave me alone, I will leave you alone. If you don't get involved in my business, I won't get involved in your business. If you stay out of my stuff, I will stay out of your stuff. The word that we have for that in 21st century United States of America is, starts with a T, do you know it? It's tolerance. Live and let live. I remember saying to him, bro, Christian morality is different. Jesus didn't teach, do not do, as you would not have done. Jesus actually teaches, do, as you would have people do unto you. But even more than that, Jesus teaches something else. He teaches, love your neighbor as yourself. And as we were having this conversation, all of a sudden it occurred to me that not only has Jesus taken that negative morality and turned it this way towards the positive, but Jesus actually pushes it one step further. That if you want the center of the bullseye of the ethical teaching of Jesus, it's not love as you love yourself, but it's love as I have loved you. Guys, that is a totally different kind of love than love your neighbor as yourself. So you know what the truth is? I don't know that we always want to be loved the way that people love themselves. <laughs> There's some people that I look around at the way that they treat themselves and I go, don't treat me the way that you treat yourself, please, please. But that's the miracle of Christianity. The miracle of Christianity is that Jesus, the ultimate Good Samaritan, has come into our lives and he has taken up our broken, failed love and he's healed it in his love. He's put his heart inside of us and then he sends us out in the world with his mercy and with his grace and with his peace. So when we come, when we gather for worship, it's part of what we do when we gather at the table here. We're not coming to the table patting ourselves on the back and going, see Jesus, look, I had a great week. I've really rendered a good service to my neighbor. What we do when we come to the table is we go, we have not loved you, Lord, with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, Father. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. We're asking Jesus to come and heal us. So Lord Jesus, here we are before you with broken love, with failing love, with love that's not enough and not big enough to save the world, but your love is large enough to save the world. <laughs> and we need your love inside of us. So we're asking that in this space this morning that you'd search us, that you would know us, that you would test us and know our innermost thoughts, that you'd see if there's any wicked way in us, and we know that there are many wicked ways in us, and that you'd lead us in the way everlasting. We're asking that the fire of the Holy Spirit would descend on us afresh, and that you would make us all flame with your love and your goodness and your grace as we prepare for the coming of the kingdom 
of God for the return again in glory of the Lord Jesus who will come to judge the living and the dead. Make us ready for that, we pray. Come, we're asking. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen.